I'm Sandra Kelly, and I'm reading from On the Drop Side of Yonder by Jacqueline Brunet. This is Chapter 7, Central Mountain, and it's Gregory's Thrill Mountain. It was like a pilgrimage for kids like us, living in Gregory and surrounding areas, when we dragged our sleds from all directions towards Central Mountain on the day of the first heavy snowfall, it meant that the most exciting days of winter were ahead. A glacier had formed the enormous hill we call Central Mountain, and geologists called it a moraine, as the ice retreated some 20,000 years ago, circling the huge hump were gently rolling farmlands, and in the winter, Central became a challenge to climb as one labored to pull a sled up its steep and slippery slopes. But, oh, the thrill of the ride. The slide down was not always accident-free, as bumps and holes not visible under the snow could easily throw an adventurer off his sled, and he would go head over heels the rest of the way down. All sides of the mountain were steep, except for those where large bushes grew. Each trail hollowed out for sledding and skiing had a treachery of its own. It was little wonder that many parents were reluctant to allow their children to go to Central Mountain. Bumps, bruises, and an occasional sprained ankle or broken wrist occurred every year, but it didn't stop the thrill-seeking adventurers from returning. The mountain and the acres around it were owned by a farmer, Wilmer Crossman. I don't recall that he ever forbade the kids to come onto his property, and I'm reasonably sure that no one ever sued him for injuries sustained on the mountain. I suspect that he had enjoyed sledding and skiing when he was young. It was thrilling to wake up and find that a foot of snow had fallen overnight especially on a Saturday morning. My brother, Elwyn, and I, with our mother's permission, of course, hurried through breakfast and dressed for the trudge to Central. The distance was probably less than a mile, kitty-cornering across our properties. With deep snow, clumsy boots, and a sled to drag, it seemed miles away, especially on the trip back home, when we were half-frozen with throbbing toes and fingers and a full bladder. After a couple of trips sledding to Central, I was content to slide down the hill by the school across the road from our house. Then I'd go home to sit by the stove and read a book. My preference was to wait until spring or summer to climb Central and then to enjoy the breathtaking scenery from there. I could see trees sprouting, new leaves, Holstein cattle feeding in the meadows, echoes of corn and wheat in their various stages of growth from there. But not Elwyn. He was good for a trip to Central every day the snow conditions allowed. Because it was his favorite place, he bragged that he was going to buy Central Mountain when he grew up. And we had a great aunt who, when she came to visit, grabbed us and planted big, juicy kisses on our lips and our cheeks. Our family had never been demonstrative that way. So after the aunt left, Elwyn told my mother with fire in his eyes that when she came to visit the next time, he was going to Central Mountain and he was going to stay there until she left. Mr. and Mrs. Crossman eventually decided they were too old to continue farming, so they moved into a small place in a nearby town and put the property up for sale. Elwyn, by this time, had finished high school, spent a couple of years in the Army, and worked several years in our dad's business. He married, and now he was the father of two children. He bought the Crossman farm, which included Central Mountain, his favorite old haunt. And I heard that Mr. Crossman was pleased that it was bought by a Gregory native. Today, Central Mountain is still surrounded by crops growing in the summertime. Elwyn had a punk dug beside it, which usually has fish, frogs, geese, ducks, and swans. 
Cranes come in the summer, and deer and other wild animals the year round. When he first bought the farm, he re-erected Mr. Crossman's windmill, which had been taken down after, presumably, the latter sold his horses and replaced them with modern machinery. Elwyn also rigged up a sort of ski lift on Central Mountain early on, and a tractor pulled ropes that somehow got the skiers and the sled riders and their equipment to the top. No one had used it for the last several years. A couple of years ago, my brother Elwyn built a mini golf course on and around the mountain. He and his buddies still engage in crude tournaments as a diversion from the professional courses. A car or a truck can drive up to the top of Central, where the scenery is still magnificent, although the drive down is still harrowing, in my opinion. I last tried a sled down that hill from the top of Central in the very early 1990s, and I had my young grandson Trevor with me and we made it part of the way down before upsetting and driving snow up our noses and into our eyes and inside our boots and our gloves. I knew then it would be my last attempt. And this poem speaks to that experience. If I could begin again, all over again, I would pray thankfully for each rise of the sun. If I could begin all over again, I'd stand in amazement at sun setting everyone. If I could begin all over again, I would give thanks for the rivers, the oceans, and land. If I could begin all over again, I would thank God for the mountains so grand. If I could begin all over again, I would work diligently for the country I love and send grateful prayers through the stars above. That is a reading from On the Drop Side of Yonder by Jacqueline Brene. You can read the other 13 chapters and listen to them at the same place you found this one.